Look, these are people who are talented and have done this before. You can't just appoint novices. Uh, you have to have people who know what they're doing. But at the same time, moving forward, this is an administration that's going to run very differently than typical Washington. Our all stars tonight A.B. Stoddard, associate editor at Real Clear Politics. Charles Hurt, political columnist for the Washington Times. Daniel Halper, online Washington bureau chief for the New York Post. And Tom Rogan, columnist with National Review. Great to see all of you tonight. All right, Tom, you said you still have some friends who are recovering, as we talked about from Brexit. They're still digesting uh, the Trump uh, uh, election, but he's now full on in transition mode. We have two uh, names today, Reince Priebus and Steve Bannon, with different roles, um, two very different guys. Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, I think most Republicans in Washington will be very happy uh, with the choice of Reince Priebus because he is seen as someone who uh, can go and meet with not just Republicans on the Hill, but Democrats, a good interlocutor, interlocutor uh, for uh, President Trump. I think what's also interesting is you see the divergence now in the international community. Uh, the British government really making a lot of effort to outreach towards Donald Trump, called their foreign mm -hmm. minister away from an EU meeting, which essentially was going to complain about Donald Trump. But other EU nations, notably Germany, are still putting a very tough line there. And so it's very interesting to see how that binding influence of Brexit and Trump is not just mm -hmm. the, the you know, electoral surprise, but actually new kind of alliances um, in international politics. We had some positive tweets today, uh, one from Senator Lindsey Graham, who was not a Trump <laughs> fan, uh, a one-time presidential rival. Tim, during the primaries, he said, congrats to at real Donald Trump for outstanding choice of Reince to be chief of staff. This shows me he is serious about governing. There was also a Newt Gingrich tweet. He says the Bannon previous team is a tremendous choice by President-elect Trump. Bannon for key strategies, previous for daily management. Great team. Now, Daniel, you know Twitter is also filled with a lot of people who don't like these choices. They're accusing Bannon of being a racist, far alt-right, you know, white national supremacist or ties to those groups. Um, so it's playing very differently. Yeah, look, like with much else with Donald Trump, if you're inclined to dislike him, you're going to hate this. And you're going to think Stephen Bannon up there in the White House, this is really bad news. Reince Priebus there. You know, this, he is by definition the Republican establishment. But if you're inclined to like Donald Trump, you, of course, will find positive things to like about this. Ryan's previous shows that he can work with Paul Ryan and work with Capitol Hill and work with the Republican establishment to try to transform Washington the way Donald Trump will be. And of course, plenty of people at home are like Breitbart and like uh, Stephen Bannon and will find a lot to like in him. But I think, I think there's a lot to read into it is what I'm trying to say. But the key here is that Donald Trump had a winning team that brought him to the White House, or that is bringing him to the White House, but successfully won this presidential election, and he is sticking with the exact same team all the way through. And I think people are probably reading a little bit too much into it and what they want to see into it, rather than just, this is a guy who wants to keep the old band back together because they helped him win, and he wants to move them into the White House together. And, well, and Charlie, he's always campaigned on the fact that he's an outsider. He's not part of the Washington elite. He's not part of that group. But by leaning on someone like Reince, I mean, he's definitely pulling in uh, the more established part of the party, yeah. those connections. And, you know, some folks say that gives them reassurance, like Lindsey Graham, that he's serious about actually governing and being the president. Well, I think that one of the big problems that uh, pres President-elect Trump has to begin with is the fact that he has run such an outsider campaign. It's, and this is a very screwed up, complex town where you have a lot of uh, various centers of power. Uh, and, and it could be a nightmare for anybody. I think it shows a, a, a degree of wisdom that he would bring in uh, somebody that does at least know Washington. I think that um, I think watching uh, some of the things that, uh, you know, some of the statements that we've seen from, uh, as you showed with Lindsey Graham and others in Congress, uh, I, I've been surprised by that. Uh, they've been far more positive than I, than I thought. That, that they would be, but uh, he faces a, a Republican Congress that really does. Uh, it, it, I, they're not going to give in to him, I don't think. I think that they're going to. It's going to be an adversarial relationship, and that's a wonderful thing for for America. And then in terms of Steve Bannon, you know, uh, Bannon was very much the heart and soul of that campaign, and uh, and I think that that he is smart to keep to have someone around who will remind him of just and, and as hot and raw and as unpleasant as a 
a lot of the views that a lot of um, uh, voters have about this place. I think it's important uh, that, that Trump be reminded of that while he's in the White House. Somebody who has been talked about a lot and was on the Trump support bandwagon very early, former House Speaker Newt Gingrich, I want to play a little bit of what he had to say about how they're going to put together this team and who may be on it. I think they're going to look very hard for people who are committed to change, who understand the general direction, not just uh, of, of President-elect Trump and, and pre Vice President-elect uh, Pence, but also of the, of the Americans who elected them. There was a real popular surge of people who want Washington changed, and that's the people who uh, President-elect Trump represents. So, A.B., does he, do you think he does some, um, picks out of left field some very different people who aren't Washington insiders? I mean, we know he had people surrounding him, like Senator Jeff Sessions. A lot of people think he's going to be offered a cabinet position. And, and some other names we're familiar with. But do you think he does anything really outside the box? Oh, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he did something just sort of unorthodox, maybe name a Democrat, too, here or there. I think that people are watching. They're watching the announcement about Steve Bannon and um, Ryan's Priebus. And as you saw, you know, Paul Ryan and, and Senator Lindsey Graham said, this is really great news that he's picked Ryan's Priebus as chief of staff, no mention of Bannon. So mm -hmm. then you have Gingrich's tweet that says, the Bannon Priebus news is so exciting, or whatever he mm -hmm. said, Bannon first. The press release named them as co equals, using that word, Bannon announced on top of Ryan's Priebus's name. Titles don't matter in Trump's world. He only consults with a few people, and he ultimately makes up his mind by himself. Steve Bannon makes him feel good. He tells him he's a movement leader, and he's changing the country, and he's moving something historical. The rest of the people around him are just managing him all the time and trying to normalize him and trying to stop him and foot, put him into wedges. And so it's, he's going to probably surround himself with the people that make him feel the best. He, he, uh, Jeff Sessions has been loyal. He'll probably give him a job, Rudy Giuliani and Newt Gingrich. Um, and I expect a lot of surprises in the other positions. But the concern for everyone at this point is the national security security staff, many of which decided a long time ago were very vocal about the fact that he was unfit to serve, didn't have the temperament to be commander in chief. They really need to come on board. And that really, I think, is the thing making the people most nervous who are watching the transition as he fills these spots. Well, Tom, what do you think the mood is like at the Pentagon mm -hmm. Defense Department uh, when he uh, obviously had the famous statement during the um, campaign talking about the fact that he knew more about ISIS than the generals did? Yeah. Uh, that didn't go over well with a lot of folks in the Pentagon. No, it, it didn't. I think people have been pleasantly surprised, though, in general, in the sense that he had that meeting with President Obama in which there was, uh, he was calm compared to perhaps his previous statements about the president. He looked a uh, little bit sobered. He and did. And I think that's the, the other fact. I did a piece of National Review last week talking about the sort of national security team that, you know, the potential to sort of bring back that establishment, not neocon, but realist. One of the interesting things is how much is his president, uh, the presidential daily brief, which he now gets mm -hmm. subject to President Obama's you know, decision on uh, sources and methods, but essentially he gets the real meat of it now. He knows what the Russians are doing. He knows that through human source, the, the very highest level stuff. And I think that's part of the sobering influence because when you see that and you see where it comes from, it's very hard to say, I don't believe it, it's fake. Uh, and I think that influence is like, wow, now, now it's up to me. And if I fail, it's my legacy as well as the country. Mm -hmm. So I think that sobering influence is why a lot of people are slightly more comfortable. But again, as A.B. says, time will tell. Yeah, the appointments I mean, will tell. Do you know how much do his choices say about the kind of administration that he plans to run as we get more names? I think it says a lot. And I think from this, again, we learned that he values loyalty. He values people who he trusts and he wants to keep them close. The white, these White House jobs are, this is why we're talking about it, they're extremely important. They make very big decisions and they help decide what the president decides and what, what, decisions, what decisions the president's going to see. So they're immensely important and we don't know these people. They don't require Senate confirmation like the cabinet members who in a way are sort of less important. They're certainly more high profile but they're, they make decisions uh, you know, that aren't as, influ as consequential as the president will. And so, obviously, these are hugely important, which is exactly why we're talking about it. Charlie, do you think that he's on track 
with a transition because there's some folks who say, listen, they didn't truly <laughs> expect that he was going to win, that there are, you know, now 4,000 positions, all these administrative and bureaucratic things that have to be filled. Um, you know, do you think that they were prepared to dive into that level of personnel appointments? Uh, there's no doubt that, uh, you know, leading into the election that a lot of his supporters were believing the, uh, you know, onslaught of media that was saying there's no way he's going to win, that she's going to win, and she's going to win by over 300 electoral uh, college votes. Uh, and so I think that there was some sort of surprise uh, in the last week and then certainly afterwards. Uh, oh, my goodness, we really might catch the car that we've been chasing. Uh, and now they have, and so they have to, to, uh, to do all that. But it, it, it's a, you know, it, it is a, because he has run such an unorthodox campaign, it's a, it is an opportunity for him to do a lot of unorthodox things now. And he can talk about, uh, you know, pr provocative picks like a Newt Gingrich in an important position uh, that would, like make a lot of people in Washington freak out, and um, a lot of the people that supported him would just would, that's they would love to see Washington freak out. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think that's why people <laughs> voted for him yeah. uh, in large part. Uh, AB, the removal of Governor Christie is kind of leading the effort, and now Vice President-elect Mike Pence. Uh, it sounds like he's got a lot of influence, and he's got his ear as he makes these big decisions. Right. I think the children um, who really, uh, ultimately, it's his daughter and his son-in-law that are the most important people on this entire planet. And so if you, that's why I said titles don't matter. You can be chief of staff, you can be chief strategist, but he's going to call Jared whenever he wants <laughs> to talk about decision making and, um, and his daughter. So um, they intervened, right? And they got rid of Corey Lewandowski, a former campaign manager. And then they had Paul Manafort in his place. And then ultimately, Paul Manafort went by the wayside mid-August and Steve Bannon and Conway took over. Trump is, as he makes these decisions, um, he, 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 he is dealing with a little bit of a team of rivals. And so you have that discomfort between Jared Kushner and, and uh, Chris Christie. Chris Christie was so loyal to Trump. Trump felt that he wanted to reward that. It's not surprising after the children promoted Mike Pence and Pence proved to be so loyal that he ended up superseding Chris Christie and was able to take on a bigger role. And Chris Christie got the rub out. He's had some bad news stories out of the Bridgegate thing, and it just doesn't come as a surprise. So he's kind of Lincolnian. We'll leave that there.